Last time on Journey to the West, our heroes reach the beautiful Western Kingdom of Women, a thriving empire entirely devoid of men. Pigsy and Tripitaka found themselves temporarily inconvenienced when an ill-advised water break left them both expecting a whole world of reproductive pain. Sun Wukong retrieved the magic spring water to terminate their predicament, and our newly unburdened heroes gingerly trekked westward once more, soon finding themselves guest of the Empress herself, who became smitten with Tripitaka and arranged for them to be wed. Mere moments after the month Monkey King extricated Tripitaka from this political entanglement. The misfortunate monk was abducted by a vicious scorpion demoness with dastardly designs on his Buddhist buns. With the help of a celestial giant rooster, which I could have rephrased but chose not to, the scorpion demoness was defeated and Tripitaka was saved. Handily extricated from this empire of entanglements, our heroes are once more free to continue their journey to the west. So our heroes are trekking westward, and perhaps unsurprisingly, speed is becoming a bit of a concern with the gang. The journey has been progressing at, shall we say, a leisurely pace, and Pigsy tries to speed things along by encouraging the horse to motor a little. The horse is unimpressed, so Sun Wukong takes a crack at motivating him, and discovers a fun bonus to having once been Heaven's official horse master, the Pima Wen, as though the horse is actually a dragon, Sun Wukong has official bureaucratic control over him, and at his command, the horse tears off at high speeds, towing the unfortunate Tripitaka along with him. As the gang pursue at a slightly better than leisurely pace, Tripitaka finds himself in a fun new predicament, as the horse runs them straight into a bandit ambush. Bandits, as is their nature, demand money, which is a problem because for religious reasons, Tripitaka has no money. The bandits don't like that very much and knock him around a little, and Tripitaka makes the tactical decision to lie for the first time in his life, telling the bandit leader that his disciple will be along any minute and he's definitely carrying money. The bandits tie him up while they wait for his disciples to come give them exactly what they deserve. The gang catches up, but Monkey spots the bandit situation and tells the others to hang back while he handles it. Then he turns into a young monk and strolls into camp to see what all the fuss is about. Tripitaka tells him he told the bandits he had money, and Monkey's like, oh, that's genius. Tell that to more bad guys, it'll give me so much more to do. The bandits circle up on Monkey and let Tripitaka go, so Tripitaka immediately hops on the horse and books it, unfortunately, in fully the wrong direction. He spent so much time heading west, you'd think he'd be better at it by now. Anyway, Monkey recommends that he and the bandits split the money, and when they assume that he's looking to profit when his master isn't looking, he clarifies that he has no money. He means that they are going to share their bandit loot with him. The bandit its attack, and only then does Tripitaka realize that leaving Monkey unsupervised with a crew of ne'er-do-wells is guaranteed to end badly, and he tells Pigsy to rush over and stop Monkey from killing anyone. Pigsy returns with good news. The bandits have disbanded from a certain point of view, on account of how they can't be bandits if they're not alive anymore. Sure enough, Monkey has killed two of them and the rest of the bandits have run off in terror. Tripitaka is very unhappy about this and insists on giving proper funeral rites for the dead bandits, and as he prays over their graves, he asks them to lay the blame for their death solely on the one guy responsible and not any of that guy's innocent friends. Which Monkey thinks is very funny because he only killed those bandits for Tripitaka, and if he didn't need to protect this hapless monk so much, they'd still be alive. He knocks on their graves and tells the dead bandits to complain to whatever gods they want, because he's on a first-name basis with all of them, and most of them are terrified of him, so good luck getting an impartial judge to arbitrate that grievance. Tripitaka's pretty thoroughly seething at this point, and nobody's happy when they bunker down for the night in a nearby village. Tripitaka asks a friendly old man for shelter and asks him to please ignore his absolutely terrifying disciples, and after a little hesitation, the old man and his family agree that it's probably okay to take them in for the night. The old man and his wife tell the gang that their family is a little bit splintered at the moment. The kid and the woman staying with them are actually their grandchild and daughter-in-law, respectively, and the kid father, their son, is a tragically misguided soul who lost his way and took to banditry. Some very awkward tea sipping ensues until Monkey cheerfully volunteers to kill him for them, but sadly that elegant solution is vetoed because the old man doesn't want to lose his only son. And fortunately, it's not too late because their son was luckily not one of the two bandits that Monkey already flattened. Unfortunately, he leads the rest of the still kinda panicking bandits straight to the old man's house, and upon spotting the horse outside, realizes their enemies are literally right where they want him. The bandits make some plans to kill the gang in their sleep, but first they they settle in for a hearty dinner, the third most important meal of the day, after breakfast and revenge. The old man takes the opportunity to sneak away and warn our heroes, so they quickly bundle everything up and sneak out the back. When the bandits realize they've slipped away, they pursue, catching up with the gang around sunrise, much to Tripitaka's dismay. Monkey's like, hey, don't worry, boss, I'll take care of this. Non-lethally, right? Non-lethally. Right? Oh, can't hear you, bye! So Sun Wukong does what he does best. Incredible violence. He just kind of kills most of them, has one of the survivors identify the old man's son among the bodies, and decides the optimal move is to behead the body to show Tripitaka, because I guess he thought that was a good idea? Obviously, Tripitaka is incredibly upset about this and recites the migraine spell while Pigsy buries the bandits. When Tripitaka finally stops, he tells Monkey he's done with him. He's just done too many flagrant, unrepentant murders for Tripitaka to be cool with keeping him on as a disciple anymore. Monkey 
begs him to reconsider, but he threatens to do the headache spell again, and taking the hint, Monkey flies away. He floats around aimlessly for a little while, considering his options. He doesn't really want to deal with immortals, gods, or dragon kings, and the monkeys at Flower Fruit Mountain will probably just laugh at him. In a way, he really doesn't fit in anywhere. Which is when he remembers that whenever there's trouble, he can always just go to Kuan Yin. So he does. He zips over to the Great Southern Ocean, says hi to Moksha, and has a little good-natured sniping with an hour formed red boy. They lead him to Kuan Yin, who asks him to tell her what's wrong and to please stop crying. Monkey tearfully explains the situation and how all he wants to do is help Tripitaka complete his journey and achieve enlightenment for both of them. Kuan Yin points out that Monkey had a lot of options for dealing with those bandits that weren't full-on murder, and he agrees that he was wrong, but he should have been given a chance to do better rather than just being fully exiled for his mistake. He plans to go to the Buddha to ask him to remove the golden circlet that binds him to Tripitaka's quest, but before he can, Kuan Yin takes a quick peek into Tripitaka's future and tells Monkey that Tripitaka will be in great danger soon. What else is new? And he'll need Monkey's help to get out of it, at which point they'll reconcile and be able to move on with the journey to the West. Realizing he's not quite out of the story just yet, Monkey settles in and starts demolishing Kuan Yin's Ben and Jerry's supply. Meanwhile, Tripitaka, Sandy, Pigsy, and the horse are continuing westward, but Tripitaka's getting a little hungry and asks Pigsy to go find him some food. Unfortunately, they're in the middle of absolutely nowhere, so Pigsy flies pretty far afield and takes so long that Tripitaka composes a whole poem about how thirsty he is, which I'm told is a common problem after a bad breakup. Sandy follows Pigsy to hurry him up, and as Tripitaka is left sad and alone, suddenly, who should appear but Sun Wukong with a porcelain cup of ice-cold water? He offers Tripitaka the water, but Tripitaka absolutely refuses, denying that he could ever need his help. Sun Wukong says there's no way they'll reach the Western Heaven without him, but when Tripitaka tells him to get stuffed, Sun Wukong smashes the cup, whacks Tripitaka, steals their luggage, and flies away. When Sandy and Pigsy return with some borrowed food and water, they actually think he's dead, but as Sandy tearfully cradles his body, he realizes he's just been knocked out. Tripitaka recovers and tells them that Monkey attacked him and stole their stuff. They bring him to the house they got the food from so he can recover, and Pigsy's fully on the warpath and really wants to go after Monkey. But Tripitaka points out that Pigsy has never, ever beaten Monkey, so it'd probably be better if Sandy went instead, and if he can't get Monkey to see reason, he should go straight to Kuan Yin. He's learning. So Sandy flies to Flower Fruit Mountain and finds Sun Wukong reading their travel rescript aloud to a bunch of monkeys. When he asks what exactly he's doing, Wukong acts like he doesn't recognize him and has his monkeys seize Sandy and drag him before him. Sandy tells him that Tripitaka was wrong to exile him and he understands why he's angry and if he's not willing to come back with him to rejoin the group, could he at least return all their stuff so that they can continue their journey? At that, Monkey laughs and tells him he didn't take their stuff out of revenge, he needs it for his own journey to the West. After all, he doesn't need Tripitaka, he never has. He could do this whole journey by himself and when he's done, he'll be remembered forever without any of those other chumps hogging the spotlight. He's just been doing his homework for to make sure he knows what he's getting into. Sandy says that won't work. Tripitaka is the chosen scripture pilgrim, the reincarnation of Golden Cicada. Tripitaka has to be the one to deliver the scriptures. That's fine, says Monkey. I got my own. Sure enough, he presents identical copies of the rest of the group. Tripitaka, the horse, Pigsy, and Sandy. Enraged at the sight of his doppelganger, Sandy leaps out and kills it, revealing it to be an ordinary monkey magically transformed. Sun Wukong is enraged and orders his army of monkeys to attack, and Sandy fights his way out and zips off towards the southern ocean to get Kuan Yin's help. Sun Wukong, meanwhile, has the dead monkey fried up for dinner, picks a new monkey to be his copy Sandy, and goes back to teaching them everything they'll need to know about their journey to the west. Sandy he touches down in the Southern Ocean, marveling briefly at its beauty before heading in to talk to Kuan Yin and to Sun Wukong, who's just chillin'. Sandy attacks him in a rage and Monkey dodges around, a little confused, and asks him to please enumerate his grievances before trying to kill him about it. Sandy pumps the brakes and tells Kuan Yin that after Monkey's bandit murder banishment, he attacked Tripitaka, stole their stuff, hijacked the entire premise of the plot, and attacked Sandy with an army of monkeys. Kuan Yin tells Sandy that that's impossible, because Sun Wukong has been with her this whole time. She's been keeping a close eye on him and he hasn't done anything even close to that. Sandy knows what he saw, so Kuan Yin tells him to take Monkey with him back to Flower Fruit Mountain to see what's really going on. Sandy is understandably suspicious the whole trip and doesn't let Monkey out of his sight, but when they reach the mountain, sure enough, they see a second Sun Wukong, identical in every way to the first. Monkey is enraged at the impersonation and charges in, demanding to know who would dare steal his face, his home, and his army of monkeys. The two Sun Wukongs begin a spectacular battle, and while Sandy is now reassured that the Sun Wukong who attacked Tripitaka was not, in fact, his trusted friend and comrade, but this imposter, he now has the new problem that he can't tell which is which. Sun Wukong, or at least one of them, tells him to go tell Tripitaka what's going on, and he'll lead the fight back to Kuan Yin so she can tell which one of them is real. As Sandy zips off, the monkeys continue to fight, shouting and insulting each other the whole time. Kuan Yin goes out to see what all the fuss is about, and Monkey, or at least one of them, tells her that Sandy's eyes weren't refined and 
enlightened enough to tell which of them was real, but surely she'll be able to unravel this puzzle no problem. Kuan Yin and all the bodhisattvas in attendance stare for a long time, evidently unwilling to be the first to admit that they have no idea which is which. Kuan Yin has them separated and tries the migraine spell, but it seems to affect both of them equally, and as soon as she stops, they start fighting again. Kuan Yin says maybe the celestial warriors he fought when he wreaked havoc in heaven will be able to tell them apart, so they fight their way up to heaven and fill the gods in on what's going on. But they have no luck either, and the Jade Emperor has them shoot out of the hall before they wreck the place, and the monkeys take their cartoon cloud of violence back down to Earth to go see Tripitaka. Speaking of whom, Sandy makes it back to the others and fills them in, and Tripitaka is very upset to learn he wrongly blamed Monkey for attacking him when in reality it was a demon in disguise. They hear a commotion outside and see the two monkeys, still locked in a furious mirror match, and Pigsy, who's wanted nothing more than a chance to really deck Monkey in the face and sees this as an absolute win, immediately flies up to quote-unquote help. After trying the migraine spell one more time, which continues to not help, the monkeys go back to fighting and zip down to the underworld to see if King Yama can tell which is which. When they're gone, Tripitaka and Pigsy tell Sandy about Monkey's hidden cave in Flower Fruit Mountain, which Sandy didn't know about but is probably where their gear was hidden this whole time. Tripitaka tells Pigsy to go and get it while both monkeys are distracted, because imposter aside, Tripitaka is still angry at the real monkey and has no intention of taking him back as his disciple, ice cold. Meanwhile, the monkeys fight their way into the underworld, absolutely panicking the ghosts, and head for the Ledger of the Dead, hoping that it'll be able to clarify things. Unfortunately, there's no entry for fake Monkey King, and the whole thing is a little screwy anyway on account of how Monkey himself sabotaged the Ledger that one time, so all the documentation on Monkeys worldwide is completely borked. However, there is actually an option. King Yama calls forth D. Ting, a monstrous dog-like being capable of telling true from false. D. Ting listens carefully and actually gets something. He says he knows the name of the false monkey, but he can't say it, and they can't help in capturing it. See, the problem is the identity may be false, but the power is real. The false monkey is actually as strong as the real one, and if he were revealed here, he might absolutely demolish the underworld in retribution. D. Ting says the Buddha can help, though, so the fight heads back to the surface and towards the Thunderclap Monastery, where they arrive just in time to serve as a good-bad example in the Buddha's lecture on emptiness and understanding. The monkeys stop fighting, kneel, and explain the situation. Kuan Yin also rolls up to corroborate their story, and explain that she couldn't tell them apart, and neither could all the gods in heaven and the underworld combined. The Buddha explains that the problem they're running into is that none of them know everything. He says that in the universe there are five kinds of immortals, celestial, earthbound, divine, human, and ghostly, and five kinds of creatures, short-haired, scaly, hairy, winged, and crawling. However, in the whole universe there are four spiritual primates that do not fall into any of these ten categories. The first is good old Sun Wukong, the intelligent stone monkey who knows transformations, recognizes the seasons, discerns the advantages of Earth and is able to alter the course of planets and stars. Then there's the red buttocked baboon, with knowledge of yin and yang, an understanding of human affairs, and the ability to avoid death and lengthen its life. Then there's the long-armed gibbon, who can seize the sun and moon, shorten mountains, distinguish auspicious from inauspicious, and manipulate planets and stars. And finally, there's the six-eared macaque, a nearly omniscient being with very sensitive hearing, knowledge of past and future, and comprehension of all things. With all this laid out, Buddha declares that the false monkey, who is clearly aware of distant events in order to maintain his disguise, must therefore be the six-eared macaque. The macaque, now exposed, freaks out and tries to run, but he's quickly surrounded, and when he turns into a bee to try and escape, Buddha traps him under his golden alms bowl, revealing his true form. Sun Wukong, enraged at what the six-eared macaque put him through, kills it, which upsets the Buddha, but Monkey points out he was guilty of assault and robbery anyway, and any court would have had him executed regardless. Which I guess is better. Anyway, with the false monkey situation officially dealt with, the Buddha says it's time for Sun Wukong to return to Tripitaka. And while Wukong is convinced that he'll never take him back, Kuan Yin goes with him and very kindly informs Tripitaka that the Buddha himself says he was wrong to kick out Monkey and if he actually wants to survive the journey, he'll focus on helping Monkey become a better Buddhist and disciple rather than just kicking him out at the first sign of trouble. Tripitaka takes the hint and accepts Monkey back into the gang, and with everyone filled in on the evil twin situation, the bad blood has officially been dealt with and the gang can continue their journey to the west. The heroic Monkey King has defeated his dark reflection, and our heroes, once shattered by mistrust and manipulation, now present a united front against whatever dangers they might face. But will that unity be enough? A burning mountain looms on the horizon, and beyond it a monstrous enemy that the Monkey King once called brother. Our heroes will face perils old and new next time on Journey to the West.